In our last lecture, we began to look at the life of Jacob, with whom, in distinction to Esau, his brother, God established his covenant. So God did not establish his covenant with Esau, but with Jacob. Jacob, however, only obtained the blessings of the covenant in the way of struggle. And the life of Jacob is characterized by this struggle for the covenant. He struggled for the covenant before he was born, holding on to Esau's heel in the womb in an attempt to be born before his brother. He struggled for the covenant because of the realization that Esau had the birthright which he, Jacob, desperately wanted. And this was a good struggle, and he had a good goal. He wanted the blessings of the covenant. But in this good and holy struggle, Jacob often resorted to sinful methods. And that's something you will see time and time again in the book of Genesis where the life of Jacob is recorded for us. He relied upon the arm of flesh. We saw that last time he cheated his brother by buying the birthright from him for a mess of pottage. And although Esau was certainly to blame, he wickedly sold his birthright for a mere mess of pottage, Jacob was also to blame because of his deceit. And then Jacob attempted to secure the birthright blessing through lies, deceit, and trickery, as we also saw last time, when he lied to his blind father Isaac, pretending to be his brother Esau. And so Jacob's struggle was essentially the same struggle that we all face as Christians. The struggle with the flesh against the spirit. Or the struggle with the flesh against faith. Jacob had faith. He believed that God was the covenant God. He believed that there were covenant blessings, but he struggled against his own flesh and so often would resort to foolish and sinful methods. And he had to learn, just as all of us have to learn, that we inherit the blessings of the covenant not through our own sinful efforts, but by faith. Faith in God's promises, not our own clever schemes. And as Jacob tried to obtain the covenant through his own skill, his own, his own ingenuity, and even his own deception, God taught him, as he often does his children, through painful chastisements. He taught Jacob that his ways were displeasing to him until finally Jacob comes to his goal in the way of faith. And as the writer to the Hebrews expresses it in Hebrews 10, 36, ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So that applies to, to Jacob. And therefore the life of Jacob must be both encouragement to us. God is faithful to his covenant promise. We must see that in the life of Jacob. And also it must be a warning to us. Do not be like Jacob and trust in the arm of flesh because you put yourself at risk of experiencing God's fatherly but painful chastisement. Last time, Jacob, we saw, was forced to flee from the land of Canaan. 
Because Esau, his brother, desired to kill him. Because Jacob had tricked Esau out of the birthright blessing. And so Esau planned to kill Jacob as soon as his father would die. And Esau assumed that his father was near to death. And hearing this plot by Esau, Rebekah, Jacob's mother, and Esau's mother too, persuaded Isaac, her husband, to send Jacob away, far away from the ridge of Esau to Haran. And Haran is where Rebekah's relatives still lived. And Isaac sent Jacob there with his blessing, commanding him not to marry a woman of kin, which, remember, is what Esau had done. Esau had taken to himself already at this point two heathen women from the land of Canaan. And so Jacob is now on the run from his brother Esau. He now has to travel all the way to Haran, far away from the promised land. And on the way, as he's leaving the promised land, he encounters the Lord. We read of that encounter in Genesis this is the first recorded encounter that Jacob had with the Lord. He dreamed of a ladder, a well-known dream, a ladder set on the earth and reaching to heaven. And God spake to Jacob from heaven. And here is what God said. I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy families shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Genesis 28, 13 through 15. So here's Jacob. He's very discouraged at this point. All of his efforts to gain the blessing for himself have failed miserably. He's now running away from his family to the land of Haran. He needs encouragement, and the Lord appears to him. And notice what the Lord says. First, God's words to Jacob constitute a promise. Jehovah speaks about who he is and what he shall do. He doesn't speak so much about what Jacob must do, but rather about what he, Jehovah, promises to to do. I am, he says to God, I will give, I am with thee, I will keep thee, I will not leave thee, I will do that which I have spoken. Notice second that God's words reference his earlier promises. And here we have continuity in the covenant again. They're based, these words are based upon a relationship that God had with Jacob's grandfather Abraham and Jacob's father Isaac, and that therefore God had with Jacob himself. I am the Lord God of Abraham, he says. I am the God of Isaac. And by implication, I am also the God of Jacob. This then is the same covenant that God had made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Noah before that and with Adam before that, God is now making or establishing or causing to stand, that's the meaning of that word establish in the Hebrew, to cause to stand. He's making or establishing or causing to stand the same 
covenant that he has always promised. And third, and flowing from that, the blessings promised to Jacob are essentially the same ones as those promised to earlier recipients of the covenant. Jehovah will be Jacob's God. Which means, remember, that he enters into a relationship of friendship with Jacob to bless him and to save him. Jehovah will give Jacob a seed. Which, remember, is remarkable at this time because Jacob is unmarried and childless at this point in his life. This seed, says Jehovah, will be numerous, even innumerable, and will spread across the globe. And ultimately, of course, this seed is Jesus Christ, who according to the flesh is the seed of Abraham, and therefore the seed of Isaac, and therefore the seed of Jacob, as Galatians 3 verse 16 clearly states. And this promise of a seed is the same promise given to Abraham in almost the same words. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. Here, in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, is the promise to Jacob in Genesis 28, 14. And God had made the same promise, remember, concerning a seed to Adam, the seed of the woman, and to Noah. And he shall make the same essential promises again in the future, as we shall see, God willing, as we continue our series through the history and development of the covenant. Moreover, Jehovah will give to Jacob and his seed a land, the land of Canaan. Verse 13, the land where on thy liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And remember, we've seen this before, the land as such was never the actual possession of Jacob or his sons. But his descendants did possess it centuries later. And remember, the land was always a picture of the heavenly kingdom, which Jacob and his spiritual seed including us, inherit. And that's clear from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And these promises are remarkable. Because from every earthly point of view, in Genesis 28, these promises were impossible of fulfillment. Jacob was a fugitive from his brother's wrath. How could he ever have an innumerable seed? Jacob was fleeing from the land of Canaan, which neither his grandfather Abraham nor his father Isaac possessed. He's going in the wrong direction if he's ever going to come into possession of the land of Canaan. Never mind cover the earth with his seed. Nevertheless, God's promises, although they might seem unlikely of fulfillment, must be received by faith. Where we see no possibility of fulfillment, God is not at all hindered in accomplishing his word. He emphasizes this in verse 15. I will do, says God, that which I have spoken. And then Jehovah adds a personal promise. And this personal promise must have stirred Jacob's discouraged soul. I am with thee, he says. I will not leave thee, he concludes. And Jacob must remember these words during the long discouraging years, the long and dangerous sojourn in Haran among his mother's relatives. 
Because although Rebecca intended to send away her son for a short period of time until Esau's anger would subside, actually, Jacob was there for decades. It's unlikely, as far as we can see, that Rebecca ever saw Jacob again in this life. And Jesus Christ makes reference to this vision, the vision of Genesis 28, in John chapter 1, where we have the calling of Nathanael. Philip, remember, one of the disciples of Jesus, informed Nathanael in John 1 verse 45, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael was initially unimpressed by this. And he asked somewhat skeptically, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip doesn't argue with him, but simply says, Come and see. He comes and meets Jesus. And after a short conversation with Jesus, Nathanael exclaims in faith, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel, John 1, 49. And then Jesus assures Nathanael, in verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven opened, and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jacob saw a ladder which connected heaven to earth and the angels were ascending and descending upon it. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of that vision. I am the fulfillment of Jacob's ladder. I am the one mediator who unites heaven and earth. And by his death on the cross, and by his glorious resurrection, and by his triumphant ascension, Jesus brings poor earthbound sinners to heaven. Now Jacob's response to Jehovah's vision is fear, fear, a godly fear, a holy trembling. And he names the place, previously called Luz, he names it Bethel, and Bethel means house of God. And then he anoints a stone, a pillar with oil, and he makes a vow to the Lord. Verses 20 and 21 of Genesis 28. If God be with, if God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Jacob's response here is inadequate. It's evidence of weak, prevaricating faith. Oh yes, Jacob had faith, but his faith must be purified and strengthened and perfected. There's something missing here. We must never, as Jacob here attempts to do, we must never make our faithfulness to God conditional on God's performance as our God. That's what Jacob does. Jacob here is attempting to bargain with God. I will take Jehovah as my God if he does X, Y, Z. If he does what I want him to do as my God. But Jacob must learn that Jehovah is unconditionally Jacob's God, and Jacob must be unconditionally Jehovah's friend servant in the covenant. Jehovah will teach that to Jacob again through many years of chastisement. Now Jacob travels about 5,000 kilometers or 3,000 miles to Haran, 
arrives in Haran, his first task is to locate his family. And that was not difficult because his family was prominent in the land and because God brought his family to him at the well. Possibly the same well as the one at which Abraham's servant had met Rebecca many years before, thus finding a wife for Isaac. And at that well, Jacob encountered Rachel. Rachel, the younger daughter of Laban. Laban was Jacob's uncle, or Jacob's mother's brother. And upon meeting Rachel, Jacob loved her and desired to have her for his wife. Nevertheless, Jacob did not seek the Lord. Had the Lord prepared Rachel for Jacob? Was she a suitable woman to marry? Was she a suitable mother for the promised seed? These questions did not enter Jacob's mind. Instead, her physical characteristics impressed him. We read in Genesis 29, verse 17, Rachel was beautiful and well favored. She had beauty. But there's no reference to godliness. Notice that. She had beauty, but there's no reference to godliness. And there is evidence in Scripture that Rachel, if she was not actually ungodly, which some people hold, was not spiritually minded or strong in faith and godliness. Leah, on the other hand, her sister, the other daughter of Laban, she was godly. And you'll see that as you read through the chapters in Genesis. However, Scripture describes her as tender eyed. In contrast to her sister, who was beautiful and well favored, Leah was tender eyed. And that expression simply means of weak eyes or of feeble eyes. Perhaps she had a physical defect of some kind. Perhaps she had poor eyesight. Whatever it was, it made her less attractive than her sister, which might go far to explaining why she was not yet married. And if Leah lived in our age, you can probably picture such a girl. She had thick glasses and was not as attractive as the other girls in her age group. Nevertheless, Jacob, without looking at any of these spiritual characteristics, Jacob preferred Rachel to Leah. And so insistent was he on marrying Rachel that he served Laban, his uncle, for seven years without a salary. He worked for seven years in order to have the right to marry Rachel. But on the wedding day, Jacob was the victim of a monstrous injustice. Laban substituted Leah for Rachel, so that Jacob married Leah instead of Rachel. And undoubtedly, there were several co-conspirators in this plot to defraud Jacob. Laban, of course, was the chief conspirator. He wanted to get rid of his less attractive older daughter. Leah must have at least consented to the fraud. And Rachel, if she knew about it, was not able to warn Jacob before the wedding day and thus prevent the fraud from taking place. And so the fraud took place. And Jacob then angrily confronted his, his uncle Laban, who offered a lame excuse. Genesis 29, 26. It must not be so done in our country to give the younger 
before the firstborn. Why did he not mention that earlier? But legally, legally, Jacob could do nothing. He was a stranger in the land of Haran. Laban was a prominent man in the country. He would not get any justice from the system of justice that prevailed there. What then could Jacob do? Well, what should Jacob have done? Jacob should have seen the hand of God in all of this. He ought to have examined his own life and his own conscience. Had Jacob not been guilty of the same thing? Had he not deceived his father in order to gain the birthright blessing? Was there not a switch, as it were, in the tent of Isaac, where Jacob pretended to be Esau in order to obtain the blessing for himself? Jacob should have seen this as chastisement from God. You might even call it poetic justice. You deserve this, Jacob. You tricked your father. Now you're being tricked by your uncle. And then Jacob should have submitted to God's mighty hand, as 1 Peter 5 puts it, without grumbling, and he ought to have received Leah for his lawful wife. Because in God's providence, Leah is not his wife. Leah was given to him as his wife. She was not his first preference. But she was, nevertheless, his wife. But Jacob doesn't learn. And those who don't learn have to go through more painful chastism. Jacob yielded to temptation. He still wanted to have Rachel. And so he commits the sin of bigamy. Two wives. His uncle, now his father-in-law, Laban, persuaded Jacob to work for another seven years in order to marry Rachel. So Laban gets 14 years of unpaid labor and gets rid of both daughters. Jacob didn't have a, le a leg to stand on legally, and so he went along with it. Now, it's, it doesn't appear to be the case that Jacob had to wait for seven more years to marry Rachel. But rather, Genesis 29, 27 says, he fulfilled one week for her. So he married Leah, and then one week later, he married Rachel, but he still had to work for another seven years before he could get paid altogether 14 years. Nowhere, you'll notice in scripture, nowhere in the account of Jacob in Genesis does God in so many words condemn Jacob's sin. It doesn't say in Genesis, and the thing that Jacob did displeased the Lord. However, God's disapproval is written in large letters over Jacob's home. Sin brings its own reward, or its own chastisement. So here, Jacob's life was miserable. He was married to two jealous, squabbling sisters. And these two jealous squabbling sisters insisted that he lie with two further women in order to father children. Jacob therefore had two wives, Leah, his legitimate wife, and then Rachel, his favorite wife, and two concubines, Bilhah and Zilpah, who were the servants of his two wives, and these four women were the mothers of his children. 
And if Jacob had been content simply to have Leah, although he wasn't, as they say, his first choice, he would have had a happier home and a happier marriage. As it was, he lived with four squabbling women, especially two squabbling, jealous sisters. But in this way, here we see the ways of God are remarkable, higher than our ways. God gave Jacob a seed. Just as he had promised, although not in the way that Jacob expected. When Jacob heard the promise of God at Bethel, little did he think that God would fulfill his promise this way. But the seed comes not only despite the sins of Jacob and his wives, but even through the sins of Jacob and his wives. And remember that the line of Christ is a line of sinners. The whole line of sinners from Adam all the way to Mary. And actually, this line of sinners ultimately fails to bring forth the promised Messiah because the promised Messiah is virgin born. And so by a miracle, God must bring forth the promised Messiah himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so God gave to Jacob the promised seed this way, but this does not excuse Jacob's sins. And that's something we have to learn in Scripture. God is able to bring good out of evil. We cannot bring good out of evil. But that does not excuse the evil out of which God is pleased to bring forth the good. And the seed of Jacob ultimately is Judah, the fourth son of Leah. And Judah's name means praise. It's through him that Christ comes, but all of the sons of Jacob are significant because they are the fathers or even the foundation of the Old Testament nation of Israel or church, and they become the twelve tribes of Israel. And so through this miserable set of domestic circumstances, God brings forth the twelve tribes of Israel, from which twelve tribes of Israel God gathers his church in the Old Testament and ultimately brings forth Jesus Christ. And the names of these sons of Jacob are fascinating. Leah gives birth to the first four, which was an indication that God approved of Leah and not Rachel. We read of that in Genesis 29 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And the names that Leah gives to her son show her faith. They show Leah's faith. Reuben signifies, see, a son. The Lord has given me a son. Simeon signifies, he has heard. The Lord has heard and give me a second son. Levi signifies join. And Judah signifies praise. Praise the Lord for he has given me four sons. However, these names have a sad background. Leah named her first son Reuben because, she said, chapter 29 verse 32, the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. Reuben's name was a testimony, a sad testimony, to the lovelessness in Leah's marriage to Jacob. And she hoped that by giving him a son, he might now love her. And that's tragic. And let no wife in the church be so desperate for her husband's love that she seeks to give him a child for that reason. 
If I can give him a child, then he will love me. Leah named her second, her second born son, Simeon, because she said, verse 33, the Lord hath heard, the Lord hath heard, that I was hated. And so Simeon's name was a testimony to the hatred that Leah experienced from her husband. That hatred was not cruel as such, in that it wasn't the case that Jacob was abusing his wife, or beating his wife, or was violent towards his wife, but rather that hatred was hatred that excluded her from his tender affection and neglected her in favor of her sister. And again, Simeon's name is a warning to husbands in the church, love your wives and show them affection. And then Leah named her third child Levi. Levi, because she said in verse 34, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Levi's name was a testimony to the lack of a spiritual, emotional bond between Leah and her husband. They lived in the same dwelling, in the same tent, let's say, but she didn't feel any closeness to her husband. It was as if they lived separate lives. She longed to be joined to him, but she felt alienated from him because of his favor towards her sister Rachel. God's command to husbands is, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Dwell with them according to knowledge, give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Marriage is a close relationship which consists of friendship and companionship. Husbands must spend time with their wives, speaking to them with affection, enjoying their company, listening to them, sharing with them. And even after three children, Leah did not experience the love, tender affection, and closeness that she longed to have with her husband, Jacob, because her husband, loved the other woman more than she. In fact, the Bible puts it so far as to say that he hated her. And the fourth son, Judah, because now will I praise the Lord, verse 35. And notice again that these names, it's striking that she names the sons, not Jacob, these names are testimonies to Leah's faith. And these testimonies are absent in Rachel. The Lord hath looked upon my affliction, verse 32. The Lord hath heard, verse 33. I will praise the Lord, verse 35. Jacob had a godly wife, but an unhappy and neglected wife, because he had taken to himself a second wife, Rachel, Leah's younger sister. Four children. In response, Rachel angrily demands children from Jacob. Give me children or I die, she says, but she remains barren. And then she decides to give her handmaiden to Jacob. Bilhah then bears Jacob two sons, Dan, whose name means judge, because Rachel deemed his birth a judgment in favor against her sister. And Naphtali, whose name means my struggle, because Jacob deemed his birth as evidence of her successful struggle against her sister. And then Leah responds by giving her handmaiden to Jacob. Zilpah then bears Jacob two more sons, Gad, a troop, and Asher, which means happy. And we see here this growing rivalry between these two sisters. Now Leah bears two more sons, Issachar, man of hire, and Zebulun, a gift or a dowry, 
whereupon Rachel finally bears a son named Joseph, which means I shall add, or he shall add, and he will be Jacob's favorite son, because he's the firstborn of his favorite wife. And then Jacob's last son, Benjamin, he's born later, and Rachel dies giving birth to him. She calls him son of my sorrow, Benoni, but Jacob calls him Benjamin, son of my right hand. And Leah also gives birth to a daughter called Dinah. And so God gives a, a seed, a large family to Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons and one daughter, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, and then Dinah. And thus God fulfilled his promise to give Jacob a seed. But notice, not without much hardship, affliction, and chastisement occasioned by Jacob's sins. And here we see the wonderful grace of God and the wonderful faithfulness of God. God did what he promised. He gave him a seed. And God preserved Jacob for 14 years in the land of Herod, far away from family and friends, far away from the land of Canaan. And God gave him a godly wife and 13 children. And Jacob did everything he could, humanly speaking, to forfeit God's blessings by his sins, by his foolishness, but God blessed him regardless. And what the psalmist says is true of Jacob as well. Quote, Thou answerest them, O Lord our God, Thou wast a God that forgivest them, though Thou tookest vengeance of their inventions. God took vengeance, you might say, of Jacob's inventions, his schemes, but he still forgave Jacob and loved him and blessed him and increased him as he had promised so to do. And so 14 years have passed. He's worked seven years for one wife. In fact, seven years for two, seven years twice for the one wife. 14 years. At the end of the 14 years, Jacob possesses nothing except the clothes on his back and the wives and children which God has given to him. He has worked for 14 years without salary, only for bed and board, and wicked Laban, covetous, greedy Laban, has neglected to pay his son-in-law and has exploited him for years. And again we say, God's hand is in this. Jacob is being chastised by God through this. Again, it's poetic justice, you might say. And after these 14 years, Jacob wants to leave. He wants to leave Laban behind, take his family, and return to Canaan. But Laban prevailed upon him to stay for a while longer because Laban notices that he is prospering because of the presence of Jacob in his household. And he doesn't want to lose Jacob. And so finally, Laban agrees to pay Jacob a salary. But again, Jacob is the victim of his wily uncle's tricks. Jacob names his wages. He says to his uncle, you give me the speckled and spotted cattle of your flocks and herds. That is to say, the ones that are born afterwards. And so Laban, hearing this, takes all of the spotted and speckled cattle and puts them on the other side of his farm, as far away from all the other cattle as possible. And yet God causes the cattle to breed and produce a multitude of speckled 
and spotted offspring, which became Jacob's. And so Jacob is getting now animals. He's increasing in animals, and animals, of course, are valuable property in that day. And so Jacob, or rather Laban, sees this. He sees that Jacob is increasing in animals. So he says, hang on a minute. I want to change the bargain. No, this time you will get all the black ones. And the same process happens. And all the black ones are being produced by these animals. He gets all the black ones. And then, oh, we'll try the white ones. We'll have about the brown ones and then the gray ones. This goes on ten times, says Jacob. Every time that Laban changed the terms of the bargain, God caused the animals miraculously to reproduce according to the animal kind or color that Laban stipulated. And the result is that gradually all the cattle of Laban are coming into the possession of Jacob. And Laban's sons notice this. The outcome is the poverty of their father, the enrichment of Jacob, and the loss of their inheritance. And they complain in Genesis 31 verse 1. Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory, they say. Now, Laban's sons had a point. Ultimately, of course, Jehovah had given Jacob his wealth by transferring the property of Laban from Laban to Jacob. And this was punishment upon Laban for his greed and his dishonesty. And this was God's gracious gift to Jacob in the covenant. Nevertheless, Jacob was not altogether honest with Laban either. There's a strange story in Genesis where Jacob resorts to the use of trickery to try to influence the breeding of these animals to get the outcome that he wants. And whatever you want to make of that story, simply understand this, that Jacob did not wholeheartedly trust in Jehovah to give him the promised blessings. He tried, as it were, to help God along. He tried to influence the result. And in so doing, he gave Laban and his sons an excuse to accuse him. And finally, Jacob says to himself, you know, I'm not safe here any longer. I need to leave. Because of Laban's envy and because of Jacob's guile, Jacob decides he needs to flee. But he flees because God commands him to leave. Genesis 31, 13 says, Arise, Jehovah says to Jacob, Arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. So he leaves in obedience to God. But he leaves with the reputation of being a trickster himself. Laban was a trickster. Jacob resorted to trickery as well. And Jacob was not justified in resorting to deceitful tricks to achieve what he thought was due to him. And Laban was enraged and might have well killed Jacob or at least enslaved him, but for the fact that God rebuked Laban in a dream, so that Laban and Jacob finally departed in peace. And so God saved Jacob from the anger of his uncle Laban. And God then delivered Jacob from the land of Haran with a, a lot of wealth, bringing with him his four wives, two wives and two concubines, and his children, and planning them to return to the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to give unto the seed. But however, a much greater trial awaited him. 
God had protected Jacob from Laban, but as he is approaching the land of Canaan, he hears that Esau is on his way to meet him. Jacob's messengers reported to him, chapter 32, verse 6, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. These 400 men did not have peaceful intentions. Now Jacob receives news of Esau's approach near the border of Canaan, and he is afraid. Because remember, the last time he'd seen his brother, his brother had said he would kill him. Is Esau still angry after all these years? It seems to be the case because he's coming with 400 men, or armed men. And therefore, a severe trial awaits Jacob just before he enters the promised land again. And graciously, God meets him with angels at the beginning of chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Mahanaim means double host. You have A-I-M at the end of the Hebrew name. It means two, the number two or double. Double host, indicating the presence of mighty angels. And these angelic hosts must have encouraged Jacob. Nevertheless, Jacob's first reaction to tidings of Esau's approach is to separate his camp into two. And he hopes, in so doing, that if one group is attacked, the other will escape. These words are not the words of strong faith, hoping maybe one of the groups will escape. It's prudence, perhaps you could say, prudence, but not strong faith. The second thing that Jacob does is pray. Pray in Genesis 32, verses 9 through 12. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee, deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I pass over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered. Or multitude. Jacob, you know this, addresses his prayer to the God of his fathers. O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, Jacob appeals to God's mercy and grace. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. He confesses his own unworthiness in humility before God's face, which is always fitting, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He makes an honest confession of his fears before God, which is also good, but we ought to cast our burdens upon the Lord, pour our hearts to him, and finally he makes two related requests. First, he requests deliverance from Esau, and second, he requests multiplication of his seed, which is simply a restatement of God's promise. And in that second request, the multiplication of the seed, he requests the coming of Jesus Christ, for Christ is the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, and the seed of Isaac, and the seed of Jacob. Nevertheless, Jacob's faith has not yet been purified and tested, and therefore God will purify and strengthen it even more through chastisement and testing. 
We see here, Jacob is still not wholeheartedly trusting in the Lord, for he also sends a present of 580 beasts to appease Esau. We call this hedging your bets. If prayer doesn't work, well then he'll send a present. And if the present doesn't work, well then he'll pray. And so Jacob here is halting between two opinions, trusting Jehovah and trusting himself. He must be weaned of that trust in the arm of flesh. And he finally learns this in a very striking passage in chapter 32, the climactic moment of Jacob's life when he wrestles with God at Peniel. And Peniel means the face of God. So Jacob sends his wives and children across the Jabbok stream, and he spends the night alone with God. And he does this because God has not yet answered his prayer. And Jacob is desperate for an answer to that prayer. Without an answer to that prayer, everything is lost. He, his wives, his children will be wiped out and the covenant will be destroyed. Everything is lost unless God graciously answer the prayer. And therefore Jacob prays to God all night And the prayer is described here in terms of wrestling. Wrestling or struggling with God. Prayer is a spiritual activity in which the believer lays hold upon God by faith. And for Jacob, the spiritual activity becomes even a physical activity. For Jacob struggles and fights and sweats and weeps, is brought to the very point of exhaustion and is even injured in the course of his prayer. So earnest is he in seeking an answer to his prayer. He needs, he needs the blessing of God. And Jacob's experience here is unique in Scripture. Oh yes, others have wrestled in prayer. The New Testament talks about agonizing in prayer, literally in the Greek, agonizing in prayer. But this is the only example of a, of a person, a child of God, wrestling with God in prayer, where God appears as a man to wrestle with one of his children. A man appeared and wrestled with him. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and they wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And we know this is not a mere man, because Scripture says he was also God. Verse 29, Jacob seeks the blessing from him. And he does bless it. And second, he says in verse 30, Jacob says, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And he called the name of that place Benile, which means the face of God. We know too that this wrestler was almighty. One simple touch of Jacob's thigh, and he cripples. Jacob. And this wrestler is Jesus Christ. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, who appeared temporarily as a human being in the Old Testament, as a foretaste, you might say, of the actual incarnation, where he appears truly with a human nature, takes to himself a human nature, which he keeps permanently, because Christ is still God and man forever in heaven. Christ here, Christ who 
who is the seed of the woman, Christ who is the mediator of the covenant, appears and wrestles with Jacob. Why does the Lord appear to him in this way? Why does he wrestle with him? And why does he cripple him? He does so to bring Jacob to repentance and to strengthen his faith. Because Jacob, although he is a believer, has, as we have seen, relied on the arm of flesh. And his reliance on the arm of flesh must finally be broken. Jacob must repent of that evil way. And that's the explanation given in Hosea 12. Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. He took, that's Jacob, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God, yea, he had power over the angel, and prevailed. He wept, and made supplication unto him. He found him in battle, and there he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. According to Hosea, which is not recorded for us in Genesis, Jacob wept. He wept. And weeping in the Bible is a sign of repentance. He wept over his sins. He wept over his folly. He wept over his self-reliance. He wept over his trickery. He looks over his life, remembers tricking Esau and tricking Isaac and committing the sin of bigamy and many other sins besides. And he makes, we are told in Hosea, he makes supplication. He prayed, he asked, he begged God to bless him. Verse 26, I will not let thee go except thou bless me, he said. And God blesses him. Just before, as it were, as the day was breaking, verse 26, God blessed him. Christ blessed him. And this amazing wrestling match with the Lord God, with the mediator of the covenant, leaves Jacob changed. He's a changed man. He's changed spiritually. He's also changed physically. He is permanently injured with a limp. He halts, we're told. Verse 31. He halted, or he limped, upon his thigh. God has injured him in this wrestling match. He has been humbled to the dust. And more importantly, he's blessed. And to show that, his name has changed. Israel is his new name. He was called heel holder before this. Jacob means heel holder. But now, his name means one who wrestles and prevails with God or prince with God. And what has he learned through all of this experience? He has learned this, that the blessing of the covenant, which is essentially the same one as Abraham's blessing and Isaac's blessing, and even Noah's blessing and Adam's blessing, the blessing of the covenant comes in the way of faith and only in the way of faith. Not in the way of schemes, not in the way of works, not in the way of sins, but in the way of faith. In fact, God destroys all those other works. When we attempt to reach the blessing of God, the means of those other things, God destroys those things and God makes a mockery of those things and God chastises us because of those things. But the way of blessing is faith in God's promises. And those promises are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They were fulfilled in Christ for Abraham and for Isaac and also for Jacob and also for us who belong to Christ by faith. Thank you for your attention.